Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. A day and a half after arriving in San Antonio Monday night, we have an update about the 500 migrant teenage boys temporarily staying at the Freeman Coliseum Expo Hall. They are the first group with others still to come over the next several weeks. We have some new images tonight provided by Catholic Charities. All as Jesse Degollado tells us how they're already being made to feel welcome. After their long journeys that finally ended with a bus ride to San Antonio, the 500 teen boys who arrived from the border Monday are getting messages of kindness and support dropped off by people who care. They're bringing personalized gifts with notes that say we love you and we're praying for you and we hope you're well. Catholic charity spokesperson Tara Ford says those will mean a lot to the 13 to 17 year old migrants who seem to be doing OK. The kids are appear to be doing really well. They're uh, resting, they're eating, they're playing games. And with more expected over the next several weeks, she says male volunteers are still needed, preferably bilingual, but it's not required, to work four-hour shifts from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. daily. But that could change. We'll understand a little bit more over the next few days about what is needed. Catholic Charities also has updated its website for volunteers to register. However, as expected, we have to get a criminal background check cleared first. From the response so far, Ford says San Antonio has proven itself once again to be a compassionate city. We're very grateful to our community in San Antonio for stepping up and always serving with us. Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. For more information on how to volunteer or to see our other stories we've covered related to migrants at the border and in South Texas, just go to ksat.com slash border. Morgan's Wonderland stepping in to help in the race to get residents vaccinated. Officials announcing today they are partnering with Christus Trinity Clinic to offer the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. 80 doses will be available for children with special needs ages 16 and up and their parents. It's happening tomorrow from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. at the Toyota Field off David Edwards Drive next to Morgan's Wonderland. To make an appointment, send an email to info at gordonhartman.com. Expect an appointment confirmation email or a message saying slots are filled. For more details, head to ksat.com. The big news today in the fight to contain COVID-19, Pfizer's announcement that its vaccine is safe for kids ages 12 to 15. The drug maker says in a study done in more than 2200 kids ages 12 to 15, there were no cases of COVID-19 in those who were fully vaccinated versus 18 cases in kids that were given the placebo. The study also shows that kids who got the vaccine had high levels of virus fighting antibodies higher than in some young adults. One local doctor says this news is encouraging in the battle to protect everyone from COVID-19. When you have a limited amount of vaccine, if you can vaccinate younger people, you can prevent more transmissions. So they don't tend to have a severe disease, but they tend to transmit to more people because they're out and about doing more activities and in the community. So it's very helpful to be able to get this group to overall decrease the number of cases. Dr. Bowling says Pfizer will make a request to the FDA and if given the OK, could be providing vaccines to those 12 to 15 by this summer. And to read more on that study or for more information related to vaccines like dose allocation or where to register to get your vaccine, all that information is on our website. Go to ksat.com slash vaccine. New at six, a peek at the new plans yet again for an old piece of San Antonio history. The Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee meeting right now discussing some of the revised plans for Alamo Plaza. Garrett Berger keeping an eye on that meeting for us and he gives us some of the background. The Alamo is central to San Antonio's identity and it's one of the most recognizable landmarks in the state. Plans to redesign Alamo Plaza have been in the works for years now and last fall they essentially got kicked back to the drawing board. A big part of the master plan included moving the cenotaph, a monument to fallen Alamo defenders that currently sits on the Alamo's footprint a few hundred feet south. That spurred vocal opposition though, and in September, the Texas Historical Commission shot down a permit to move the monument, which threw the future of the whole plan into uncertainty. At the beginning of the month, the mayor replaced District 1 Councilman Roberto Trevino, who has been a proponent of moving the cenotaph, on two committees for the project. Instead, the mayor tapped District 3 Councilwoman Rebecca Villagran for the Management Committee and to be one of the tri-chairs of the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee. 
It's that advisory committee that's meeting right now. We'll have more on what they present later tonight on the Night Beat. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. A San Antonio police officer facing multiple charges, including bribery and possession of child pornography in court today. Eric Rodriguez, who is out on bond in court with a request. Paul Venmo with that request and the judge's decision. Eric Rodriguez is accused of bribery for allegedly accepting money in exchange for providing information to a defendant in a domestic violence case. He's also facing possession of child pornography charges. Following his arrest, Rodriguez was placed on supervised release with an ankle monitor. He's on indefinite suspension without pay from SAPD and not allowed contact with his children. I just want to get, I want to work. You know, that's it. I just want to work. Work, work and see my kids. That's all I want to do. I mean, I got to provide for them. He told Judge Velia Meza that he will find a job and that his wife is willing to have him return home while he awaits trial. Everything's great. She's standing by my side. She's very supportive and, and she's she's ready for me to go home. Rodriguez was the hearing's only witness. The motion to modify is granted. I'm going to modify your condition of bond to no unsupervised contact with minor children. She also ordered that the ankle monitor remain on and placed Rodriguez on curfew. Paul Venema, case at 12 News. An anonymous tip leads to the arrest of two people accused in a murder on St. Patrick's Day. 23-year-old Haley Gibbons and 55-year-old Douglas Skaggs, both charged with murder for their roles in allegedly shooting and killing 39-year-old Tito Roman. According to an arrest affidavit, police were able to identify the pair through surveillance video from the Home Suites Motel near Loop 410 and Summit Parkway. Police say when they questioned Skaggs, he admitted to killing Roman as the result of an ongoing dispute. The affidavit also says that Gibbons helped him by luring the victim into the motel room so Skaggs could confront him. We're still waiting to find out the name of the suspect arrested in connection with shooting a Dimmitt County Sheriff's Office deputy. The incident happened near Big Wells by Highway 85 and FM 1867. Details about the shooting are unknown at this time. The deputy shot was transported to San Antonio via helicopter last night. The Dimmitt County Sheriff says the deputy is in stable condition and expected to make a full recovery. An apartment complex left with roughly $15,000 in damage after an unusual fire last night on the northeast side. That fire started around 11 p.m. in the 3800 block of Barrington Street. When fire crews got there, they found a pile of clothes up in flames in a first floor apartment. Firefighters were able to put out that fire quickly. Nobody hurt, but fire officials say some smoke did get into a nearby unit. No word on how those clothes caught fire. It is a pep rally with a conjunto twist. Students stood outside Southside High School to support their fellow classmates as they prepare for the star test. Southside ISD holding the drive through pep rallies at all of their campuses. What made this rally unique? The conjunto performance because Southside High School, the only school to have a group. Southside ISD even has some incentives to encourage students to do a good job on the test, like movies, a fun field day, and each student who passes will be entered to win a PlayStation 5. HEB is showing its appreciation for teachers one goodie bag at a time. Today, Northside ISD teachers were celebrated. It was part of the Texas Love Teachers drive through events at the Ferris Athletic Stadium. Teachers were welcomed with band music and cheerleaders as each car received a goodie bag filled with things like snacks, lunch boxes, and more. One teacher told us she's glad their work hasn't gone unnoticed. I love this idea. I love HEB, and I think that teachers have put in a lot of work this year, especially with all the things that were thrown at us teaching during a pandemic and all the changes that have occurred throughout the year. So it's nice to feel appreciated. Other local school districts will be visited tomorrow by the Texas Love Teachers drive through If you're accustomed to commuting on Broadway, you may have to make a slight reroute over the next two days. Beginning tomorrow at 7 in the morning, the northbound side of Broadway between Nottingham Drive and Nacogdoches Road will be closed. This means only the southbound lanes will still be open. The closure is due to crews installing an underground sewer system. Officers indeed. Detour signs will be available to help drivers work around the closed road. 
It's expected to reopen at 5 p.m. on Friday. Let's take a look at time saver traffic right now. Here's the Transcod camera at Highway 90 and General McMullen. No issues to tell you about there on the main lanes or the overpass. Things flowing smoothly at 6 o'clock. And just how low will it go tonight? Chill will be in the air this evening, Adam Kasky. Yeah, you'll notice a bit of a chill out there. The cooler air is being pushed into town. Now, the sunshine helped us out a bit today and even thinning of the clouds. So we did make it into the 70s this afternoon, but they'll really fall off later tonight. Unfortunately, the aquifer fell off quite a bit today. It's down eight tenths of a foot. And we're more than 11 feet below the March average. Take a look at our pollen count. Oak, it's high again with a count of over 2100. Mold, mulberry, pine, and hackberry all registering, but they're on the low end. 69 now in Kerrville and Lost Maples, 73 Port SA, 72 in New Braunfels, and Pleasanton, 74. So you'll notice a bit of a chill in the air tomorrow morning. Not as windy, though. That wind is really calming down tonight. In the weekend, we have an upper-level disturbance to talk about with a little chance of rain as well. All that coming right up, Steve. Here, Adam. It's the trial everyone's talking about as it enters day three. Who testified today at the trial of the officer facing charges connected to the death of George Floyd. And up next, researchers still looking into the origins of COVID-19, what the latest study suggests so far. An invitation to hang out. It's what one officer for the Harlandale School District says led to some troublesome turning points. What a lawsuit is laying out tonight in this defender's investigation. The coronavirus that causes COVID-19 likely spread to people from an animal, but the origin of the virus needs more study. That's according to a new report from the World Health Organization, the WHO. It says the research is still ongoing. In a new 120 page report, the World Health Organization outlines their theories into how the coronavirus started spreading around the globe, potentially as early as October 2019, before being detected in Wuhan, China. Well, don't forget that Wuhan was a major international hub at that time with direct flight every day to most parts of the world. Whether it started in Wuhan or elsewhere in China will need further research, as will the origin of the virus. The report gives four possible sources. Direct transmission from an animal, considered most likely transmission from an intermediate host animal, infected by another animal like a bat. Another possible pathway, the virus spread through frozen food or an accidental leak from a laboratory. Since this was not the key or main focus of uh, the trying studies, uh, it, uh, it did not uh, uh, receive the same depth uh, of attention and work as uh, uh, the other hypotheses. But the WHO says of the four possible pathways, the lab theory was ranked extremely unlikely. Not saying that it was impossible, uh, um, but not the one we would start initially uh, going deeper into. The WHO says it'll continue to look into all evidence and ideas about how the coronavirus started. And while there's no evidence to support the lab leak theory, the chief of the World Health Organization has called for further investigation. All right, back here at home, you can tell something's blowing in. You get those winds out there today. So curious. Adam, about how cool it's actually going to get around here. Well, it is pushing in some cooler air, and that's what we're really going to notice later tonight and especially into tomorrow morning. As the wind starts to pump the brakes, the clear sky and the well, calmer wind and the dry air is going to all work together to really cool us off. So let's get right to temperatures. And the sunshine went a long way, even thinning of the clouds here in South Texas today. So we're up to 72 right now in San Antonio. Even Junction, Austin at 68. You get into the 50s as you get up into the Texas panhandle. But Extra sunshine boosting Del Rio to 83 and even Catula 77. Let's go forward into tomorrow morning. OK, around sunrise at 7 a.m. We're talking widespread 40. So we're looking at temperatures about 7 to 10 degrees below average for this time of year. 44 Hondo and Gonzales closer to 50 in Catula. But then you get into the hill country and we're expecting some upper 30s in most of the hill country, even Bernie 39, getting Timberwood Park about 41, Leon Springs 42. For the most part around Bear County, I'm expecting mid 40s in the morning. Our morning low temperatures will be on the cool side again on Friday. So a few unseasonably cool mornings you may want to have that sweatshirt ready for the kids at the bus stop. But then we get into the weekend 
and those morning readings start to get back near average and then climb even farther into next week as the humidity returns. And we got rid of the humidity today with that north wind, which is now gusting around 20 to 30 miles per hour. New Braunfels, recent gust of 32, San Antonio gusting to 26, and even Uvalde, a gust to 20. The steady wind is at about 15 miles per hour now, and this will gradually be subsiding through the night. We've already seen these numbers drop about five miles per hour over the past couple of hours, and we'll just continue to trim off the wind as we go through the night. But look, it got rid of the humidity. Dew points down near 40 degrees for the most part. So a combination of that dry air, less wind, and the clearing sky for the most part will give us those cool readings tomorrow. As for dew points in the future, you're not going to notice any humidity in the air for the rest of this week. And even the upcoming weekend, you won't really notice any mugginess. It's not until early next week, by about Tuesday, that you'll notice some stickiness back in place and of course we could use some rain but this front really didn't do a whole lot for us in terms of rain a trace at the airport that's it you can get parts of east texas there and along the coastal bend eh, a few showers but the real activity is on the east coast and parts of the eastern seaboard that's where they've got the real moisture and the good rain our next system for the weekend it's this swirl that's out over the pacific you can see it better on our water vapor imagery this big looping counterclockwise circulation in the upper levels. That's going to move our way for the weekend, but it's not going to be very strong. It's not going to be all that put together. It's going to be a pretty disheveled system and might just kickstart a few very light showers, which we're just calling sprinkles on Saturday. So about 30% coverage across South Texas on Saturday and pretty light in nature. Unfortunately, I know we need the rain. It's just not really in the works anytime soon. So let's recap tomorrow 40s in the morning 45 at 7 a.m. But by the afternoon comfortable partly cloudy at 70 degrees. We do it all again on Friday 40s then up to 70 with some sunshine into the weekend fairly gray with a few of those sprinkles on Saturday Easter Sunday in the morning. We'll have a little dampness just in the form of fog and drizzle, but we're not expecting any real rain to wash out any outdoor Easter plans. Just a little bit of dampness early and comfortable over the weekend with those highs right around 70. By the way, back to 80 next week. All right. Thanks, Adam. All right. He spent his Fridays playing in San Antonio, his Saturdays playing in College Station. That's Where not. will he spend his Sundays, Larry? And Kellen Mond is wondering the exact same thing. Former uh, Texas A&M quarterback and Reagan Rattler getting ready for the NFL draft next month. Well, yesterday he put on a good show in front of NFL scouts and in the NBA right here in town. Spurs and Kings will battle again tonight. It's coming up. I didn't want to put too much pressure on myself. You know, obviously I have high expectations, but uh, you know, I, you know, today I went out and did exactly what I wanted to do. NFL draft prospect Kellen Mond put on a show at Texas A&M Pro Day in Big Board Sports. Spurs and Kings part two will go down tonight at the AT&T Center and hopefully for the silver and black. The outcome will be different than Monday night when the Kings won 132 to 115. The Spurs have fallen behind by double digits in four of their five games during this homestand and they've lost all four of those games. The only one that didn't happen was Saturday night when they beat the Bulls 120-104. On Monday night the Kings Buddy Heald and Darren Fox combined for 44 points. Both can score from inside and out making them tough to defend. They're good. I mean, both of them are, are very talented and um, good players in this league. So um, it's definitely a team defensive thing. And uh, we got to be together uh, as a unit and make it difficult for them. Spurs and Kings will play tonight at 730. Lonnie Walker the fourth was downgraded from probable to out with a sore right wrist. The official final four court is now down at the Alamo Dome ahead of the action Friday night when number one team Stanford and South Carolina play at 5 p.m. followed by number one Yukon and number three Arizona at 830 p.m. The Alamo Dome crew got to work right after game one last night. We've had uh, our dual arena configuration first game ended about eight o'clock in the south arena the crew started immediately cleaning up breaking down the court and uh, by 10 o'clock this side ended and the same thing happened here um, you know 
whole lot has happened since then. Um, both courts have been taken up. The new Final Four court has been put down. Stanford guard Keanu Williams was named to the Alamo Region All-Tournament team and was also named the region's most outstanding player. In Stanford's four tournament games, Keanu shooting 39% overall from the floor, 46% from three-point range, and averaging 15.75 points per contest. She scored 12 over 14 in the second half last night during Stanford's incredible comeback win. Texas A&M football hosted its Pro Day annual Pro Day Tuesday, showcasing the talents of many Aggies, hoping to get chosen in next month's NFL draft. Quarterback Kellen Mond will hear his name called. It's just a matter of when. Thanks in part to his senior bowl performance back in January when Mond was named MVP, his stock has risen and there's a chance a team could take him in day two during rounds two and three. Leading up to Pro Day, Mond said he's been working on his feet and strengthening his back to help with his velocity. He sounds pleased with his Pro Day performance. I thought I threw the ball really well at the senior bowl and threw the ball really well today. So, um, you know, and also running a, a, a unofficial four, five, six, four, five, seven, somewhere around there. So um, my goal was to run under four, six. So, um, you know, I was, um, you know, definitely thrilled about that. And then um, to go out and, you know, spin it the way I did, you know, missed a couple of throws, but, um, you know, that's going to happen. But, you know, I thought I had a really good workout. Nearly 50 NFL coaches, scouts, and player personnel staffers representing every NFL team was on hand to watch the Aggies, and he threw some dimes just like that deep bomb right there. Wow. I, th I think he's got a bright future. In I the think NFL. he does too. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. You got it. Still to come here, our KSAT Q&A with District 23 Congressman Tony Gonzalez about what's happening along the border. Also day three of the Derek Chauvin trial, the clerk who received an allegedly counterfeit $20 bill from George Floyd takes the stand. Plus, her attack caught on camera, but now there's a suspect behind bars. We have the latest from an anti-Asian attack we first told you about yesterday on the News at 6. We've got some late breaking news in tonight. San Antonio police handling a fatal crash where a child was injured. This playing out on the city's east side. The crash happened just before 5.30 in the 2600 block of Rigsby Avenue. You see one of the vehicles involved there. Details limited. What we do know is one person was found dead at the scene. The child transported to a nearby hospital. We're going to continue to follow this developing story. Of course, we'll have it online and on air on the night beat as more details become available. His district includes hundreds of miles along the Texas-Mexico border and with so many eyes across our nation on that very spot in our country, we want to bring in District 23 Congressman Tony Gonzalez to join us now in today's KSAT Q&A. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, we appreciate you being here. Of course, this border issue is what we want to focus on tonight, and there, there's a lot of politics wrapped up in this, going back and forth, where you stand sure. on the issues. but. Tell us what you're seeing, just what you have seen visiting parts of your district with what's happening on the border right now. Absolutely. My district is over 820 miles of Texas and Mexico border. It stretches from San Antonio out to El Paso. And I visited, I mean, I'm on the border every single week. I was uh, the first member to visit the facility out in Carrizo Springs. Uh, was recently out in El Paso where we visited multiple facilities most recently, the one at Fort Bliss that is going to house up to 5,000 migrant children. Uh, while I was in El Paso, I also visited Juarez. And it's important for me to do this one thing, which is tell the story. Let's start there, and then we can pick it apart as far as policy and topics and, and political rhetoric. But I, I, what I've really tried to do is just tell the story, and it's heartbreaking. The amount of migrants coming over, especially children, it, the numbers are through the roof. There's a lot of things that need to happen. Uh, and it's not just in the United States. It's, it's also spreading in Mexico. There's tens of thousands of migrants on the Mexican side kind of waiting. There in Juarez, there were 18 NGOs working around the clock to make sure that those families had a place to stay. How, I mean, what's, what do you want to see done? Give me one thing that you think could be done to help out with, you know, I, I think everybody agrees it's a humanitarian crisis. Oh, absolutely. It, it, there's really two things that I'd like to see done. 
One is resources to Border Patrol agents. We can't forget about them. I did a, a three and a half hour uh, night tour with them, and they are working around the clock, just doing amazing work. Their fathers, their mothers, you know, their their parents, they're having to uh, see and deal with this all 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 night long. So uh, give them resources. And what I mean by that is technology. Uh, you know, they need technology for, for stuff on the border. They need more manpower. They need things as simple as more horses, believe it or not. That's one. The other is I'd like for, for us to have a serious conversation on immigration reform that, can, that we can actually pass. And what I mean by that is work visas. To me, work visas make sense. If somebody wants to come to America to live the American dream, then let's bring them. Let's let's give them an opportunity to do that. But let's do that through the front door. I think those are two areas that we can start and then build from there. One of my biggest questions with what we're seeing right now, my biggest concerns has to do with the unaccompanied children who are coming across the border. Some say, well, people who, you know, adults should be turned back if they're not supposed to, to cross over legally. But what do we do about the kids who were coming over here by themselves, some as young as toddlers. Oh, it's, it's absolutely heartbreaking. And, you know, when I was on that ride with the uh, Border Patrol there in El Paso, I mean, literally within minutes of our ride, we came across three young children uh, that had just kind of uh, came over to the American side. They were traveling from Honduras. Uh, their trek was 22 days uh, long. Uh, what is happening, it, it is very organized, though. You know, they're not really traveling alone. They're traveling, the, the cartel is essentially operating like a travel agent. They're going, how much money do you have and where do you want to go? And then they give you a bracelet. They go, if you pay in full, you get this bracelet. If you don't pay in full and you owe us something else, you get this bracelet. And then there's another bracelet. If, you know, you're, let's say you're going to transport some uh, contraband for us, you get a different bracelet. I say all that to go, the migrants are stuck in this uh, environment that is harmful to everybody. Talk about, you talked about immigration reform. That's something that, that both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, have talked about. And, and I'm going to talk about something that seems rare in Washington these days, bipartisan support. Do you think you can get bipartisan support for any kind of immigration reform? I, I do. I do. But I think it first starts is, is by showing up. And that's what I've uh, with what I've done and what I will continue to do and see it firsthand, not on CNN or Fox or read it in a book, but see it, feel it, talk to the people on the border that are there doing, doing the work every single day and then bring others. You know, I brought about a dozen members to El Paso from across the country, Tennessee, Florida, Iowa. We're going to do about another dozen members here in Del Rio and Eagle Pass. Uh, in about another 10 days or so to bring people down because, you know, us, we live in, we live in South Texas, we live in West Texas. So we know uh, kind of what is happening at least a little bit more than others. We got to bring them down. And then it has to start with reasonable solutions, right? Uh, some of these, some of these proposals right now uh, are, are dead on arrival. The other is work with one another. When I was in El Paso, uh, you know, Representative Escobar and I, we visited a few facilities together. It's things like that. Yeah, absolutely. When you were running, you were uh, focused, some of the focus was on securing the border. And you said that putting a wall in high traffic areas was a, a solution that you believe in. Given what we're seeing right now, do you still think that a wall is the solution? There, our border needs to be secured by a layered approach. So one of those layers is infrastructure. It absolutely works. Another layer is technology. You need that. I'll give you another example. Since I was recently there in El Paso, there's 150 miles of border. Out of that border, 130 miles of the wall have been built. But the technology piece, only 24 miles have been built. That's an area that, that we can improve on. The other is manpower. Like you need to have all three of those in order to be successful. But the root behind all that is immigration reform. I think there's a way for us to be compassionate and, and uh, allow opportunities for those that wanna come live the American dream. We have to refine that. We gotta increase our work visa numbers. We have to encourage people to come through the front door. I think it's the right thing to do all across the board. 
Congressman, before we let you go, I want to I want to continue this conversation because it's so complex on what we're talking about when it comes to the border and and some of the politics that are playing out. But before I let you go, I want to talk about something you haven't talked about before, to my knowledge, and that's the fact you're having surgery tomorrow on your vocal cords. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You were yep. intubated during a surgery and it affected intubated incorrectly during a surgery. It affected your vocal cords. So you're going to be not able to talk for a while coming up, correct? For a little bit. I mean, it should be for, for hopefully just a few days. Hopefully everything goes well. But, you know, living here in San Antonio, we are blessed to have such amazing health care providers. And the folks, the men and women at BAMC have just done a, an amazing job across the board. That's why I'll get my my surgery done tomorrow. It's been a little frustrating uh, having to deal with my voice. It's a, literally a daily issue. Uh, I have to stay hydrated nonstop and, and all these other things that we do to maintain it. I'm looking for sort of looking forward to uh, the surgery, but I'm excited to, to honestly give it a little break, heal, and then just get back to work. Congressman, we're wishing you all the best. Hope for a very speedy recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. We'll be right back. An update now on a story we first told you about yesterday about a 65 year old Asian woman who was seen on camera being beaten and kicked repeatedly. The suspect accused in that case has been arrested. New York police identified the man as 38 year old Brandon Elliott. He was arrested overnight on charges of felony assault as a hate crime. Police say surveillance video shows Elliott violently kicking the woman to the ground and then repeatedly on the head. They say he also made anti-Asian statements telling the woman she didn't belong here. Elliot previously arrested back in 2002 for fatally stabbing his mother when he was 19. He served 17 years in state prison, was released on lifetime parole in November of 2019. Jurors in the trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin hearing today from Christopher Martin. He's the clerk at Cup Foods who received the alleged counterfeit $20 bill from George Floyd on the day he died. Martin showed remorse. Disbelief and guilt. Okay. Why guilt? Um, if I would have just not taken the bill, this could have been avoided. Over the past three days, the jury has heard from numerous people who witnessed Floyd's death. Chauvin is facing manslaughter, second and third degree murder charges, to which he's pleaded not guilty. The three other officers involved in Floyd's death go on trial later this year. Queen Elizabeth carrying out her first face to face engagement this year today, just two days after the country's strict COVID-19 lockdown was eased. The 94 year old monarch who has continued to carry out her official duties by video link since a lockdown was imposed at the start of the year. Today, the Queen visited the Air Force's memorial in Surrey to mark the centenary of the Royal Australian Air Force. The last engagement she attended was back in December. We'll be right back. And during the pandemic, many Americans became at home bartenders. So which home concoctions were the most popular? Travel rewards company Upgraded Points looked at Google results from the past year to find each state's most searched mixed drinks. The results tell an interesting cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out the mimosa, the most popular in the highest number of states with six. Now here in Texas, though, as well as two other states, the margarita took the crown. Mm, margarita. Peep this sweet exhibit at the Racine Art Museum in Wisconsin. People from around the country submitted nearly 150 pieces of art made out of or inspired by. That's right, Peep's candy. The creations include everything from dioramas and sculptures to paintings. It's the 12th year of the seasonal contest and the very first Peep's piece, Greetings from Racine, getting a permanent home at the Racine Museum. That's a pretty good use of Peep's. I'm, I support that use. Yeah. I don't support eating them. Yeah. Personal choice. They're, they're not my favorite. Mm -mm. But. If you're looking for an excuse to unleash your creativity, today is National Crayon Day. Invented back in 1902, the classroom classic has entertained many generations of school children. Get this, there are 3 billion Crayola crayons made each year, but what you do with those is up to you to create. You can post your creations with the social media hashtag National Crayon Day. 
Do you also know what today is? Oh, here we go. A friend of a friend of Adam Kasky told me today is National Adam Day. Adam Day. A D A M. A D A M. National Adam Day. What and, what does that mean? And says who, right? I Your know friend. there was a the, he had a source. The but, internet. It's all that matters. Yeah, the I'm not even going to get into the guy in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, in the basement with three screens who makes up these days. Now, this is a friend of yours that yeah. put this out on Twitter, letting me know. I know. He also has a great picture that if you follow either Adam Kasky or myself's Twitter page, you will see that was good. of a fully decked out yep. Adam Kasky. I I've seen it. it. I mean, you were just missing a thermometer. You were in you were, your element. You were in your element, Always exactly. Am. Ready to go fishing. <laughs> That was actually my Halloween costume. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was a good, good nice. quick and easy Halloween costume. Yeah. I already had all the gear ready to go. All right, so our wind will be gradually diminishing tonight. We'll have a cool start to the day tomorrow and then a little bit of dampness as we head into the upcoming weekend. Let's talk about the wind. That was a big headline out there. Pretty gusty throughout the day. Right now, the gusts are down between 25 and 30 miles per hour, and those are some of the more recent gusts. The steady winds are generally between 10 and 20. And these steady winds will gradually be diminishing and subsiding as we go through the night. So here's our future cast. 10 o'clock, still a bit breezy out there. A northeasterly breeze at about 15 miles per hour, even higher south of town. Then we get into early tomorrow morning at sunrise and the wind has really calmed down. I mean, we're talking five to 10 miles per hour for most of us sunrise tomorrow. So the wind not really playing a role in the day tomorrow. Dew points, they're down. That north wind pushing in some cooler air, but also drier, less humid air. So it feels pleasant outside. You don't feel the mugginess that we had yesterday. And you're not going to notice it until we get into the early part of next week. Basically, next Tuesday, expect mugginess back in the air and a return to humidity. All right, let's talk about our weather pattern quite across Texas. We had the cold front slide through with it. A trace of rain here in San Antonio at the airport. The real action is along the eastern seaboard. They've got the widespread precipitation and none of that is headed our way. It's all moving away from us. The next system that's going to drop into town is this upper level swirl that counterclockwise circulation just off the Baja Peninsula there. This is going to take its time headed our way and it's not really going to be all that put together so it's not going to pack a big punch it's basically just going to stir things up a little bit as we get into the weekend particularly on saturday at that point we could have a few sprinkles or areas of light rain sunday some dampness in the morning but not really adding up to anything so here are those rain chances you look at next couple of days zero percent get into saturday up to 30% and I think that's the best we can do here in the foreseeable future and that's mainly just a few sprinkles not adding up to a whole lot. 60s for most of Texas you get down into South Texas we've got our 70s a little bit of sunshine went a long way this afternoon helped our temperatures rebound we're 72 New Braunfels and San Antonio 68 Kerrville Beeville right now at 73 but tomorrow morning you'll notice a bit of a chill in the air closer to 50 south of Highway 90 mid 40s around San Antonio and along Highway 90, but you get into the hill country and that's where readings will drop down into the upper 30s in the morning. So we're talking about 37, Kerrville, Pipe Creek, Bandera, even Fredericksburg about 37, Bernie 39 degrees in the morning, Timberwood Park 41, most of San Antonio in the mid 40s. Then by the afternoon, temperatures rebound nicely right up near 70, mixture of sun and clouds and look at that east wind at only 5 to 15 miles per hour. So we're not looking at a blustery day tomorrow. We're not going to even notice the wind for a couple of days into the weekend. Mainly gray. I think we'll squeeze in a little bit of sunshine late on Easter, but overall a fairly gray weekend with just a few stray sprinkles Saturday and morning fog and drizzle on Easter Sunday, but not the kind of thing that's going to wash out your outdoor plan. Just a little dampness, but temperature is comfortable. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Good morning, everybody. It is Wednesday. It is March 31st. Pfizer sticking it to the coronavirus again, the first to be proven effective in children younger than 16. Getting emergency use authorization now from the FDA will impact mass vaccination sites in just a few months. Effective today, parishes may open all pews and reduce social distancing from six feet to three feet. 
Other protocols, though, like mask wearing, still a requirement. The Archdiocese says it will continue to evaluate the health situation and will make future changes as it sees fit. Over the past three days, the jury has heard from numerous witnesses to Floyd's death. Chauvin is facing manslaughter and second and third degree murder charges to which he has pleaded not guilty. The three other officers involved in Floyd's death go on trial later this year. The IRS says payments are going out this weekend for Social Security recipients and other people who qualify to get it but don't normally file a tax return. The IRS says employees are working tirelessly to deliver the economic impact payments as quickly as possible and estimates the majority of payments will be received April 7th. And first at five, a human error. That's why federal officials say production of Johnson & Johnson's one dose COVID-19 vaccine has been halted. About 15 million doses ruined at a Baltimore manufacturing plant. According to the New York Times, the Food and Drug Administration is investigating and has halted future shipments for the moment. Johnson & Johnson vaccines that are currently being used nationwide, we're told, were not affected. <laughs> I'm a little disappointed Adam Kasky's not getting behind National Adam Day. Nope. <laughs> but you couldn't hear him, but that was a big fat nope. I'm bringing that up because there's really not a lot going on traffic-wise <laughs> as you look at Gen 90 and General McMullen. But happy National Adam Day to everyone. Just not Adam Kasky because he doesn't care. <laughs> we'll see you on the night beat at 10. Thanks for watching.